Hello. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Um, I'm glad we have such a nice turnout to talk about customer experience. This is a topic that is very near and dear to my heart. I'm a vice president and principal analyst at Forrester Research. And specifically, I write research all day long that is geared towards helping this new breed of customer experience professionals do their jobs better. And I'm also the co-author of Outside In, uh, the subtitle is The Power of Putting Customers at the Center of Your Business. And so what I want to share with you today is really what the title of this sounds like, From UX to CX, um, helping all of you who may not be familiar with customer experience really learn what the connection is to user experience um, and then how you can start to think about your own career uh, and your own work within the context of uh, this bigger trend that's happening out there in the business world. So what I want to start by doing is just telling you a little bit about me. And believe me, I usually don't do this in presentations, and I feel a bit awkward <laughs> talking about me um, at the beginning here. But I think my personal experience will give you kind of a lens into how I made the transition from UX to CX and was kind of observing these changes happening around me. So uh, I started out in uh, 1995, and I designed and developed my very first uh, website. <clears throat> I was doing an internship at AT&T Bell Labs, and they basically handed me HTML for dummies and the Pearl Camel book and said, go make something. And so I made what I believe is probably the world's first social shopping app. Um, and it was kind of crazy because at the time we had to make this huge leap of an assumption that people would actually have a phone and an internet connection. Um, so anyway, I, I got my hands dirty uh, in the web uh, very early on. From uh, During 1996, I was a uh, webmaster for the Indiana University Alumni Association. Um, 1999 to 2001, uh, I managed a web design and a development team at a dot-com that no longer exists. I feel like I was really part of that dot-com boom and bust. Um, from 2002 to 2004, I got a master's in human-computer interaction from Carnegie Mellon. And during this time, I also worked as an interaction designer. Uh, I designed and developed an interactive electronic technical manual for the Office, Office of Naval Research. That's always such a tongue twister. Um, and then I also worked as an intera interaction designer for a company called Body Media. You may have heard of them uh, recently. They're in the wearable space. Oh, yay, Body Media. All right. So then in 2004, I became this very weird animal that is known as a forester analyst. And the type of work that I started doing uh, really started to shift. It was, it was quite a bit different. I was drawing on all of this background. Um, but my work largely consisted of doing things like going out into uh, the world and um, trying to complete tasks on kiosks or uh, websites and doing essentially heuristic evaluation. So I became kind of a usability analyst. Um, and then I would write these reports for Forrester where I would detail how all of these websites and kiosks and other types of interfaces sucked, just how much they sucked and exactly why they sucked. So then, you know, at, at the time, my, my group was really focused on all kinds of different interfaces. So interactive voice response systems, web kiosks, um, kind of looking at a little bit at the, the multi-channel uh, uh, user experience as well. But then something happened around 2007-ish, 2008, and I, sorry, I wasn't able to find a report actually that old. But some of my colleagues started talking about this thing called voice of the customer. How many people here know the term voice of the customer? OK, so a few of you. So I was like, what is this voice of the customer thing? You're just calling user research something different. Like this is, we've been doing this in the UX field for a long time. Well, in fact, this turned out to be um, a little bit different than the type of user research I knew about uh, through my previous work experience. And around this time, we also started to ask questions like, will companies ever appoint chief customer officers or chief experience officers? We were talking about them at the time. And then a funny thing happened. Around the year 2010, we didn't have to ask that question anymore. Because suddenly, we saw a complete jump in the number of people who actually had this title. And these are real chief experience officers, real chief customer officers out there in the real world. They've got slightly different titles. But you can see they run the gamut from 
uh, telecom, insurance, uh, financial services, technology, healthcare, media. In every industry that is out there, both B2B and B2C, we are seeing the rise of these CCOs, chief customer officers. But these chief customer officers, chief experience officers, didn't really look and feel like me. Um, in fact, they had very different backgrounds from the background that I came from. Um, so some had experience as a division president or GM. Um, you can see marketing, operations, sales, service, and then strategy. Uh, and IT actually as some of the top fields that people uh, were coming from and moving into these CCO positions. And because they didn't share this same background as me, um, I had to start learning a different language in order to communicate with them. And um, I was actually just talking with uh, some interaction design friends over the weekend. I was having uh, breakfast over at, at their house. And they said, you know, we see you tweet but we have no idea what these hashtags are that you use. What do these things even mean? So CEM, Customer Experience Management. Uh, CXO, the Chief, Cust or Chief Experience Officer. We also t hashtag CCO. Um, NPS, who knows what NPS is? Yep, OK, so it's just a handful. Net Promoter Score, this is a metric that customer experience uh, professionals use. Uh, VOC, there's that voice of the customer again. And then we've got a couple of hashtags that we use um, just to denote customer experience itself. So in addition to having our own language, uh, the customer experience field also has its own gang. Um, and so just like any emerging field, uh, the CXPA was born uh, a couple of years ago to provide really more of a peer-to-peer -peer network uh, and educational environment. So with all of this happening, you might still be wondering, OK, but what is customer experience? Well, at Forrester, we define customer experience as how customers perceive their interactions with your company. I'm going to come back to this definition in just a couple of minutes. Um, but first, I want to ask, or I want to answer the question, why do executives care about customer experience? I know for a lot of the time that I was in the UX field, um, I and my peers were incredibly frustrated. You know, why don't the executives get what we do? User experience is so important. Well, guess what? They are waking up to the value, the business value of customer experience. And there's a couple of reasons why. First of all, they are scared. Okay? They know that they are on shifting sands. And to help you understand really the message that we're going out and explaining to them, I want to just quickly walk through what's happened in the last 100 or so years of our economic history. So when you think about the time period from 1900 until 1960, we're in the age of manufacturing. And during this time, if you owned a factory, you owned the market. Then from 1960 until 1990, we were in the age of distribution. During this time, if you owned a distribution network, you owned the market. From 1990 until 2010, we were in the age of information. Following along, if you owned the information, you owned the market. And when I get to this point, people start waving their hands furiously and saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Aren't we still in the information age? I mean, we were bombarded by information from every single direction. And while that is true, at Forrester, we believe that starting in 2010, we entered a fundamentally different era. And we call it the age of the customer. And of course, you can't own your customers today like you could own a factory or distribution network or information in the past. And so those companies that are going to succeed, that are going to dominate the market, own the market, are going to be those companies that learn how to truly understand their customers and then engage with them in meaningful ways. And so when we're talking about this, you know, the important thing to realize, and I'm sure all of you see this, all of you are doing this uh, in your jobs, but all of these previous sources of competitive uh, differentiation, they've all been commoditized away. And the net result is that companies can no longer compete on product features. They're looking for something different, and that's where customer experience has come to the forefront. And we've seen not a lot but a handful of customer experience leaders that have emerged and they have set new standards that every company on the planet needs to compete with now. So this really starts to scare executives when they, have, they start realizing that they compete with Mickey Mouse. This is not the same game that they went to business school to learn how to win. 
And of course, as these companies are resetting customers' expectations, if customers don't get what they want, they are gonna, these companies are going to hear about it in very public ways. Because of course, we all know that consumers today have more power than ever, and this is never, ever going to change. Now, I know all of you know all of this. This is not a newsflash. You guys are creating the disruption in this room for all of these other big companies around the globe. But the message that we try to impart to them is that it really doesn't matter how successful these large organizations have been in these prior ages. If they want to succeed for the next several decades, they need to shift their perspective and they need to start focusing first and foremost, on the customer experience. So that's reason number one. They're really scared. Reason number two is that customer experience is worth billions, billions with a B, billions of dollars to organizations, uh, big and small. So let me walk you through how we've come up with that number and how I can actually stand here and, and say that. So going back to our definition of customer experience, we define it as how customers perceive their interactions with your company. This interactions piece is one of the pieces that really separates the field of customer experience from the field of user experience. So we're talking about interactions that happen at every single stage of this customer journey. And you know, it doesn't matter if you're talking about subscribers or members or shoppers or patients or travelers. All customers go on this same archetypal journey. And so we're not also just talking about digital touch points, which is what the UX field has traditionally focused on. We're talking about marketing communications and conversations with sales reps and calls into customer service and interactions that happen at the point of sale in a retail store. Okay, the product itself, the unboxing experience. We're talking about every last channel, every last interaction. So that's one piece of this definition. We also have the word perceive in here. It's the customer's perceptions that ultimately matter. And when we're talking about perceptions, we talk about them in terms of the customer experience pyramid. So how many people in here are familiar with Liz Sanders and her work and her definition of the customer experience pyramid? Oh, good. I got one hand in the back. Thank you. So uh, the original version of this was developed by Liz um, back in, gosh, I want to say like the mid-90s. I actually forget the, the actual date. But hers goes useful, usable, desirable, which are probably terms that you're probably a little bit more familiar with from the UX world. Um, and here we've shifted them to be more palatable and meaningful for people from other parts of the business. But the idea is essentially the same. You've got to make sure that your customers perceive that you're meeting their basic needs, that they're getting what they're paying for when they interact with you. Um, then you layer on ease of doing business and then enjoyability. And enjoyability is not about you know, plastering this permanent smile on customers' faces and sending them skipping down the road. This is really something different, though, for organizations because it's about realizing that their customers are more than just a number in a CRM system, that their customers are human beings with emotions and attitudes and goals of their own. And so again, that's really different for a lot of organizations to start thinking about that. So what do we do with this, this set of perceptions? Well, every year at Forrester, we do a benchmarking survey, and we go out to US consumers, and we ask them about the big brands that they've done business with most in the last 90 days. And we ask them, how well did Brand X meet your needs? How, uh, how easy was Brand X to do business with? And how enjoyable was Brand X to do business with? They answer on a scale of 1 to 5, and then we do it to math. And then uh, essentially what happens, and I'm happy to describe the math um, after this presentation if you'd like to know how this works. Um, what we do is we come up with a single score for each company. And then in aggregate, those scores form what we call our customer experience index. And what you're looking at here for every industry is the high score and the low score. Those are the, the blue uh, boxes for each industry. And then you've got uh, the red circle, which is the average score for uh, that particular industry. And what I'm putting in here is what we call the green line of goodness, because it separates those companies with a good or an excellent customer experience from those who have an OK, a poor, or just a downright terrible customer experience. So 
what are the business benefits of being on the right side of that line? That doesn't come for free, okay? This is a really important thing to remember. A lot of companies say, oh, well, let's just be like Zappos. You know, well, sorry, it's not that easy. It might be a, a nice uh, kind of vision to paint, um, but it's going to cost time and money in order to actually get there. So what's the ROI? Why should we even try and deliver that good customer experience? Well, in addition to asking consumers about their perceptions of the companies that they do business with, we also ask three questions related to loyalty. And what we find is that customer experience indeed correlates with loyalty. Specifically, we find a strong positive correlation between customer experience index scores and consumers' willingness to consider another purchase and their likelihood to recommend to a friend. And we also find a negative correlation between customer experience index score and likelihood to switch business to a competitor. So this means the better your customer experience is, the more likely your customers are to buy from you again, to tell their friends about you, and the less likely they are to take their business somewhere else. So when you think about then the financial impact uh, that is associated with these loyalty metrics, it really adds up to those big dollars that we were talking about. So what we do is we feed these correlation coefficients into a financial model. Um, and for each industry, we plug in some basic assumptions like the size of their customer base and uh, the value of a repurchase. And our model finds that improving customer experience, so moving essentially from a below average score in an industry to an above average score in an industry is literally worth millions of dollars and in the case of hotels and wireless service providers, we are talking literally billions of dollars. And that is not for, let's say, the TV service providers as a whole or the credit card providers as a whole. This is millions or billions of dollars of incremental revenue for any single company in any one of these industries every single year. And that is just incremental revenue that is associated with improving the customer experience. So this is why executives across the globe have started to perk their ears up to customer experience. Customer experience is also uh, associated with cost savings. I'm sure a lot of you develop those types of ROI models yourselves um, for the, the UX work um, that you're involved in. But there's one other way that I want to talk about the business impact of customer experience. And if you work at a public company, this might be very interesting to you. Um, if you don't, you may still be interested in this from your own personal investing perspective. And that is the connection between customer experience and stock price. So the analysis I'm about to show you is actually uh, done by a company called Watermark Consulting. They're a customer experience consulting firm. And they said, what if we took two stock portfolios and compared them? And let's call one the customer experience leaders portfolio. And this is the top 10 publicly traded companies in the customer experience index for any given year. And let's compare that to the customer experience laggards portfolio. This is the bottom 10 publicly traded companies in our index for any given year. So to help you understand the analysis that uh, this organization did, let's assume that it is 2007. This is the first year that we published our customer experience index. And let's say you went back in a time machine and you invested $10,000 in that year's customer experience leaders. And so you took your 10K and you divided it equally amongst those top 10 publicly traded companies in the index for that year. Meanwhile, your buddy down the street, he took $10,000 and he invested it in that year's laggards. So he took his 10K and divided it equally amongst those bottom 10 publicly traded companies in the index. At the end of 2007, you both sold your holdings. And then at the beginning of the uh, year, 2008, you both reinvested in that year's leaders and laggards, respectively. And then you did the same thing again and again through 2012. This is what the S&P 500 looked like over that six-year period. What do you think happened to the leaders' portfolio? Yes, up 43% return over that six-year period. And what happened to the laggards? Yeah. See all that white space there at the bottom of the screen? Yeah, that's where our laggards are going to fill in. So they were down at nearly 34% over six years. 
So hopefully this gets you all excited about the value of customer experience. I often at this point get asks for the leaders <laughs> the, uh, from this year's um, uh, uh, customer experience index. So um, what I want to talk about next is what the problem is. Um, so you know, there's all this great um, uh, potential for improving the customer experience. So what's going wrong? Why, why isn't this happening? Why aren't we just you know, immersed in these blissful customer experiences every time we interact with an airline or a large bank? Well, the problem actually gets back to this customer journey and how this maps internally to organizations. So what we typically see is that we've got a marketing team who is responsible for interactions that happen at the first two stages of this journey. And then they sometimes get uh, involved at that re-engage stage through loyalty programs. But then they throw things over the transom to another group, uh, a retail group, uh, you know, a physical big box um, arm of the organization, an e-commerce group for those buy interactions. Um, access, this is everything that happens in between the buying and the using that enables customers to get their hands on all that stuff that they've purchased. And honestly, I find most organizations just kind of ignoring that that even happens. Use, um, a lot of companies have, of course, internal product development design uh, organizations, uh, service organizations. Uh, you know, the, the service design organizations are less common within organizations, uh, so we typically see them outsourcing that to an agency. Then we move on to get support. Again, we're throwing it over the, to the transom again to a customer uh, support group and operations side. And then no one's paying attention to the interactions that happen when a customer leaves. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you can agree with that. So this is what ends up happening. We've got each part of the organization working on bolstering the interactions that they feel that they are personally responsible for. But then this is what the customer journey looks like. <laughs> Very painful, right? Customers have to make these huge jumps as they go from interacting with one part of the organization to the next and cross from digital to non-digital channels and back again. Very painful, obviously both for the customer and therefore for the organization. So this is what we're really trying to do. We're trying to build a unified customer experience that spans every channel. Uh, it's got to be unified from the perspective of the customer so that when they see marketing materials and then go to the website and then call into customer support, they don't feel like they're dealing with three different companies. It's also got to be unified from the perspective of the brand. The brand is one of the key assets that companies have. And most companies are not doing a good job of making sure that the brand is infused at each and every single customer touch point. So this problem takes me into what I want to talk about next, which is what are the tools of customer experience? And I'm not going to spend time comparing and contrasting the tools of UX and CX, because I figure if you're here at this conference, you're probably pretty familiar with the tools of UX, or you've heard about some of the various tools um, already at the conference. So what I want to introduce to you is uh, what we call Forrester's Customer Experience Maturity Model. And it essentially describes six disciplines that companies need to learn to master if they do, in fact, want to reap all of those business benefits that we've just talked about. And these disciplines, I think, are a really nice way to talk about and understand all the different tools and methodologies um, that customer experience professionals are using on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, I've got kind of a space theme going on here. I've got another version of this presentation that talks about Copernicus and, and things like that. So um, bear with me. Um, hopefully we've got some space geeks in the audience. Um, I'm one of them myself. Um, but these pictures, um, if nothing else, I hope they will help you just remember um, a little bit about what these six disciplines are. So the six disciplines are strategy, customer understanding, design, measurement, governance, and culture. And so some of these might be familiar to you from the UX world, um, but even, and some may not be, um, but even the ones that are familiar from the UX world, they take on a slightly different twist when we're talking about customer experience. So I'm going to tell you um, just a few stories, uh, one story for each of these disciplines, just to help you illustrate really what these mean in the context of the broader customer experience. So the first three disciplines are all about helping companies create the right customer experience. And that's the right customer experience for their business strategy, for their brand, and of course, also for customers. So let's talk about 
strategy first. When we're talking about strategy in the context of the business world, a lot of people think that we're talking about a roadmap or a plan. But as this picture implies, when we're talking about a customer experience strategy, we are talking about a vision for the future. So we're talking about describing the intended experience for the customer. What type of experience do you intend to provide? What is that going to look like? What is that going to feel like? And so to illustrate really how this works, I want to tell you a quick story about the Holiday Inn. They've got about 3,000 hotels worldwide, and they have on-site restaurants in about 750 of those hotels. The restaurants were having a problem because they were losing their dinner customers to the restaurants that typically flank their properties. But even worse, they were losing their breakfast customers to gas stations. <laughs> yeah, they were really not happy when they realized this. So what did they do? Well, I'll tell you what they didn't do. They didn't just start making a bunch of one-off changes to their pricing or to their menu. Instead, they stepped back and they created a customer experience strategy. They rooted that strategy in their four key brand attributes, inclusive, purposeful, social, and familiar. And they described the target audience for this experience. They call them the everyday heroes. These are kind of mid-scale, very down-to-earth types of both business and leisure travelers. And when they were going out and doing that research into these everyday heroes, what they realized is that they didn't want to just eat and drink, and, and that was really the focus of this project when it started. They had a food and beverage problem. But what they realized was that in addition to eating and drinking, these everyday heroes also wanted to have fun. They wanted to relax. They wanted to connect both to home and to work, and they wanted to transition seamlessly amongst all of these different activities. So Holiday Inn encoded everything that they learned into a strategy that they dubbed the social hub. And it's a lot more complex than what I can get into um, in the time that we have today. But at the core are these three statements. We give our guests flexible options so they can be themselves. That way they don't have to leave the hotel to get what they want. They can find it at the Holiday Inn. And once they had described this strategy, they were able to create a series of interactions that were appropriate for the different activities that their customers wanted to do and that were also appropriate for their brand. So for example, in the bar area, to make it even more social, they put in these perpendicular peninsulas that you see to act as magnets for people to gather around. And in the business center, they installed Apple computers for aesthetic reasons. I kind of like that idea. But guess what? I am not their everyday hero. And so they realized that their everyday heroes were not typically Mac users. So what did they do? They installed the Windows operating system on those machines to make them feel more familiar. Yeah. So when you think about all of the activities, all of the different people involved in developing and then continuing to deliver this experience, from now through eternity, you've got the people up front, so architects, interior designers, um, IT engineers, and then on an ongoing basis, you've got folks like chefs and servers, receptionists, janitorial staff, and all of those people have got to have the same, a singular vision for what type of experience they need to provide, and that's what the customer experience strategy does. Now, the reason this strategy worked so well for Holiday Inn is because, as I mentioned, they had a very clear and accurate understanding of who their target customer was. And that brings us to discipline number two, which is customer understanding. So I know that the UX world does a lot of user research. Um, the customer experience world does as well. They do some of the same types of research that you guys probably do, ethnographic research, usability testing, um, but they do a lot of additional types of research as well. They do a lot of surveys, and this kind of pains me sometimes how many surveys they do and how much they rely on this. Um, they do a lot of focus groups, also this kind of pains me. Um, they dig into analytics and big data. Um, they are mining social media media for sentiment. Um, they are doing natural language processing uh, and sentiment analysis on phone calls, emails, and chats. Um, and they also do this thing called voice of the employee. Just as we've got voice of the customer, they tap into uh, the deep knowledge that their employees have about their customers and what their problems are. So, um, oh, and they also develop things like personas 
and uh, journey maps that some of you may be familiar with as well. Um, these documents that codify all the different learnings that they've got. So just to show you how customer understanding can be applied to something other than uh, a typical UX project, I want to tell you a very quick story about Virgin Mobile Australia. Virgin entered the Australian telecom market about a dozen or so years ago, and um, they recently earned the number one spot in customer satisfaction. They had won a bunch of awards, and everyone there was very happy. Well, not really. Their executive team was not happy because in their hearts, they knew that the experience that they were providing was essentially no different than those of their competitors. And for a company operating under the Virgin brand name, that was a huge problem. So this is a quote from their former COO. He said, we weren't interested in being up to par with industry standards. We wanted to create a differentiated customer experience, one that was uniquely Virgin. And to do that, they had to understand what their brand meant from the perspective of their customers. So they asked about 15 or so of their customers to fill out an online diary every day for a week. Um, they asked them to upload pictures and stories as they related to their three key brand attributes, simplicity, fairness, and control. Here's what one of their customers said about feeling out of control. And now that's a picture that he uploaded of himself feeling out of control. He said, I feel like I'm out of control when I am cooking without a recipe. It makes me feel like I am not getting the best possible result. I know the ingredients that I have at hand would make a nice dish, but I cannot get there. So up until this point, Virgin thought that control meant giving their customers options to modify their plans to meet their individual needs. And to that end, they were just about to get ready to move from 19 standard billing plans to a system where customers could slice and dice hundreds of plan options any way they wanted, like some kind of giant telecom salad bar. But as you can tell from what we just saw, this is not what customers wanted at all. To their customers, control meant having a greater understanding of a smaller number of options. And they reacted instead of moving to the salad bar plan, they reduced the number of plans um, by half and then reduced them by half again. So I just really like this example about how um, uh, customer understanding can be applied to something like a, a product offering, a service offering, or, or even pricing. Design, discipline, uh, design is a, the discipline number three, and it's actually the discipline I'm going to talk about the least um, because I figure this crowd probably knows the most about it um, <laughs> compared to a lot of the other uh, types of crowds that I'm typically talking to. You probably either follow yourself or familiar with a typical human-centered design process. The thing that really makes design different in the customer experience world is the degree to which it is applied. So, if you're not familiar with this, uh, the Mayo Clinic uh, designed new outpatient exam rooms and the interactions that happen within those spaces um, following a, a very standard human-centered design methodology. And there's a service design agency uh, called Live Work that redesigned call center interactions for uh, a company called Jensidiga, which is Norway's largest insurance provider. I actually just worked with uh, a large manufacturer and we used co-creation and design to actually work with that manufacturer's distribution partners to redesign their supply chain to make it easier for their distribution partners to do business with them. To me, that's really exciting. I know it might sound a little bit unsexy to redesign a supply chain, but it was a hell of a lot of fun. Okay, so those are the first three disciplines, strategy, customer understanding, and design. And again, they're gonna help you create the right customer experience. The second set of disciplines is gonna help you manage those experiences effectively. So let's start with measurement. Measurement is one of those things that when we talk about customer experience, people tend to be like, oh, it's too fluffy, it's too intangible. There's no way we can measure this, right? Well, that's wrong. A company that recently learned how to actually put a comprehensive measurement program into place is JetBlue. As many of you probably know, they have a mission to bring humanity back to travel. But the problem is that for many years, their employees had no way to know how well they were doing that every day because they just weren't measuring it. So here's what they do now. The workhorse of their measurement program is in fact a survey. And there are lots of good reasons to do surveys and this is one of the best. So they send a survey out to their customers at the end of their travel, and they ask them to grade each part of their experience with JetBlue, from originally booking through to arriving at their final destination. 
And then when those surveys come back, they attach operational data to the survey, like which channel each customer booked through, and whether or not they had any problems through their travel, like making maybe a broken seat back television or a flight delay. And then JetBlue asks one other type of question. They ask what their customers are going to do as a result of their experience, like fly JetBlue again or recommend JetBlue to a friend. So together, all of these different pieces, they're really the three core building blocks of a solid customer experience measurement program. You've got perception metrics that tell you what the customers think happened. You've got descriptive metrics. This is the operational piece that tells you what really happened. So we often talk about, OK, customers say they were on hold for forever. Well, reality, the descriptive metrics tells us that OK, they were on hold for two and a half minutes. Now, that doesn't mean that we dismiss the feeling of forever. That means that we now know that two and a half minutes is in that sweet spot of feeling like forever. And we've got to get that hold time down lower. And then the other key ingredient here are those outcome metrics. And when you pair the outcome metrics with the, percept uh, the perception and the descriptive metrics, it's then that you are able to attach a financial model that will tell you what type of business impact you can expect from making specific customer experience improvements. Now, hopefully, if you are out there helping to collect these type of metrics, it's not just for your health or because you think you should do it. These metrics are really only effective if they are funneled into an effective governance program. And when we talk about governance, there's really two types of governance. There's reactive customer experience governance. That's about plugging the holes, fixing what's broken. And then there's proactive customer experience governance, which is about making sure problems don't happen in the first place. And I want to just talk briefly about reactive governance here. Uh, what you're looking at is um, a customer listening post at Adobe's headquarters. And um, you can see uh, some of the screenshots on the right. They're bringing in social media, survey data, um, other types of analytics. They've uh, got screens that have video feeds into their various call centers around the planet. And they can tap into any individual agent's calls at any time. And they hold meetings in here to really bring people in and get them immersed in these customer insights. Uh, and of course, people can access all of this data remotely as well. But to make sure that all of these insights and all of this data, all these metrics don't go to waste, they funnel all of them into a customer advocacy council. And this council is made up of uh, their different departments and then their two largest business units. And it is a responsibility of this group to size, scope, and prioritize those issues that they think are going to have the biggest impact on the customer experience and on their business as well. And then this company, or sorry, not company, this organization, this council, partners with another council within the company um, that's called the Business Process Improvement Council. And it is that second group that greenlights specific initiatives, assigns resources, and assigns a senior executive who is going to make sure that people stay accountable and actually see that initiative through to completion. So that's a little bit about how governance typically works. And that, what I just told you about, bringing in customer feedback, prioritizing the issues, making sure you fix them, those are all the components of a standard voice of the customer program. The only one I didn't talk about really is closing the loop, um, which is where you go back to the customers and you say, hey, you told us X. Here's what we did as a result. Please tell us more about what's broken. Please, sir, can I have another? OK, so the sixth discipline is culture. And while it's discipline number six, I also think about it sometimes as enveloping all of the other uh, disciplines. Because this is really about driving customer centricity into your organizational DNA. And when we talk about shifting culture, um, the academics and the professionals have agreed that there are really three primary levers to pull. The first is hiring. You change who you're bringing into the organization in the first place, so you make sure you're hiring people who have a desire to serve customers, um, and also who are aligned with your company's particular customer experience strategy. Socialization, these are things like training and rituals and storytelling. The storytelling that we talk about at this conference is certainly uh, relevant in a broader CX uh, uh, discussion. And then rewards, both informal rewards, a spot bonus, uh, movie tickets, uh, recognition at a company meeting. And then also formal rewards. A lot of companies are putting customer-centric 
metrics, customer experience metrics, into uh, bonus structures and also into the requirements for promotions. So um, these are all kind of top down, right? These are things that come from executives. You will change your corporate culture. But changing a corporate culture also has to happen from the ground up. So just to tell you a little bit about how one company worked on that, um, John Deere Financial, their executives recently created a new series of customer promises. And if you're reading these, you probably agree that these are great. These make a lot of sense. The only problem was as soon as they made these promises, the executive team realized that they did not have the culture to deliver on it. And so what they did is they recruited people from across the organization, volunteers for a two-year program that they call the Customer Experience Champions Program. And it is um, essentially a, an ongoing, a rolling two-year program. In year one, these people attend monthly training sessions where they get immersed in customer insights and they learn relevant customer experience skills. And then in year two, they take all that back to their home departments where they define and then manage their own customer experience projects. And one of their recent champions did one of the bravest uh, uh, projects. She tackled what I think has got to be probably one of the worst customer experiences out there, getting a call about an overdue account. And so she created storyboards and training that helped their collections agents understand that their particular customers don't have a steady income. They've got agricultural customers who are rather flush with money at parts of the year and have basically nothing at other parts. So their collections agents were, after this training, able to ask better questions, get better information, and ultimately be more flexible managing those accounts. And the result is that the collections touchpoint now has one of the highest experience scores in the company. The collections touch point, this guy. This is pretty amazing. OK, so those are our six disciplines. Um, and I hope that they've given you a window into really kind of the mechanics and the mindset of customer experience. I just want to leave you with a couple thoughts. Why should you care about this? Well, the first reason you should care about this, and probably the biggest reason, is that the customer experience train has left the station. This is a monumental shift in the way that companies are doing business. There's about a conference every single week, if not more than one a week. Um, as you can see, we've got a professional organization. This is happening, OK? So the way I look at it is that UX professionals really have a couple of options for getting on this train. The first is stay in UX, continue to do the work that you love, but do it better. Do it more effectively by aligning your work with the customer experience initiatives within your organization. I think you'll find that you have to fight less for funding, um, for resources, when you can align your work with the bigger transformational efforts that are happening. The other option you've got is to move to customer experience, like I did and apply your UX skills to a broader set of customer experience initiatives. And um, just so it's, you, don't, you don't think I'm the only crazy person who's done this, um, out of these chief customer officers, um, Fred Leichter is a little bit different than the others because he actually built Fidelity's first website back in, I, I forget the exact year, but you can imagine when it would have been. Um, and he managed their user experience team for about 15 years. And it's only been within the last several years that he's moved into this chief customer experience uh, officer position. Um, but it has happened, and I'm starting to hear of more and more people making this transition. So whichever path you choose, I think they're both great paths. Um, but I hope that today I've been able to help you understand really what's going on in the field of customer experience and give you some ideas for how you can take advantage of that to propel your own careers. So thank you so much for your time. I unfortunately don't think we're going to have a lot of time for questions. Um, but if you have questions, um, please feel free to get in touch with me. Also, I'm going to be doing a book signing right now. So I'm not going to take questions in here, but I'm going out to the bookstore. Uh, I'm going to do a book signing there for the next 15 minutes. And then I'm also going to do a book signing there from 4 to 4.30. So if you can't make it out there in the next 15 minutes, please come see me in that half hour. I'd be more than happy to answer any questions.